Hey, Road Trippers, welcome to another episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Ward. And I am your host, Molly Malloy. As always, it's great to have you tuning in. If this is your first episode, then welcome. If it's not your first episode, then welcome back. Each week, Molly and I take a drive along the Information Superhighway to find topics that we find interesting, obscure, funny, or downright bizarre. And then we bring them to the show to share with you, our listeners, all in the hopes that we can make your commute suck just a little less. You can find all previous episodes of the Road Tripping Podcast for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or most everywhere you listen to podcasts. To stream or download our show on your mobile device, start by opening your app and typing the Road Tripping Podcast, that's tripping with a G, into the search bar. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to our feed so you'll have access to all of our previous shows as well as all the future goodness we're planning on bringing your way. Trippers, I have an omission I would like to make. One that I personally don't like to have to do, but here I go anyway, as it is just best to get it out in the open. I was mistaken. Yes, that's right. I was mistaken, and we are not going to be bringing you the conclusion of our series on The Life of Leroy Robert Ripley. I do apologize, but it is for a very good reason. You see, as Molly and I coordinated our research notes after our last episode, we realized that we had way too much information to relay to you in the time frame of the show that we are trying to establish, so we are going to have to break down the show into even more parts. Hopefully just the one, but Ripley is so fascinating that even just one little fact can take you down another part of the metaphorical rabbit hole. Rest assured, we are only doing this to be thorough as well as entertaining and not leave you feeling overwhelmed. So if you haven't listened to part one already, Go ahead and pause the show and go back and listen to that now. If you're still listening because you did listen to part one, let's go ahead and bring you up to date. Remember, our last episode covered his younger years and what led him to his work as a cartoonist. In this episode, we will bring you to the story of how he became famous for his work, discuss his brief marriage, and end with the beginnings of the establishment of the Believe It or Not cartoons that took him from famous to infamous. All that we will get into right after this. Molly, did you know that it's possible to get local fresh groceries delivered to your front door? Yes. In fact, I've been using Instacart for some time now, and it's great. It saves me so much time. I'm sure in your busy household, that's a serious plus. Absolutely. For example, just last week, I was sitting at my daughter's soccer game when my husband called to remind me that he was bringing his boss over for dinner, and he couldn't wait for my famous lasagna. Well... It wasn't two seconds after I ended the call that I realized I still needed a few things for dinner, but the game had just started, so I couldn't leave. Instacart solved that for me with their app, and after a few clicks, I was able to order exactly what I needed. The best part was that delivery was waiting by the garage door as soon as we got home. Yeah, but is it limited to certain stores or just to name brands? No, you can shop multiple stores and get the products you love. They even highlight deals and brands you may not have seen before. The Instacart shoppers pick the products you choose based on your preferences and make sure they are picked fresh and kept safe all the way to your door. That sounds great. How do I get signed up? Follow the link in the show notes or click on the Instacart banner on our homepage, The Road Tripping Podcast. That's tripping with a G. Dot com to let Instacart know that we sent you and support the show. Instacart never set foot in a grocery store again. Trippers, Molly and I want to take a second before we get back to Ripley and give a special shout out to our listeners in Ireland. You guys really stepped up your game in the number of downloads of our show the last couple of episodes, and we wanted to let you know it's greatly appreciated. As you will recall from the last episode, we left off with young Ripley having just been hired by the San Francisco Bulletin in late 1908 as a staff cartoonist on the condition that he made good. While producing three dozen full-size cartoons and loads of smaller ones, Ripley soon found he was out of his depth when it came to his sports knowledge and the level of his abilities as an artist. While his work was good, And his co-workers did try to assist him however they could. His sense of wit and culture just didn't compare to the talents of the other artists in the profession. And within four months, he had been fired. 
Ripley didn't let that get him down, though. And even though he was terrified of being unemployed, he was determined to remain in San Francisco and continue being a newsman. So, to that end, in June of 1909, he took his portfolio to the Bulletin's competitor, The Chronicle, where he secured a job again as a cartoonist on a trial run for $10 a week. Within two weeks, his work was appearing in the paper and often on the front page. Ripley credited this to the art lessons that he began immediately upon taking the job with the Chronicle and the long, hard hours he put into his craft. Ripley definitely made good on his time at the Chronicle and within quick order had managed to double his salary to $20 a week, allowing him to bring his mother and siblings to the city from Santa Rosa. His work also started putting him into positions where he was able to meet famous people and other big names of his field. For instance, when he was selected by the Chronicle to cover the heavyweight championship fight between retired champion Jim Jeffries and Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight champ in July 1910, put Ripley into the position to be able to work directly with Jack London, the author of The Call of the Wild, who had also been hired by the Chronicle to cover the fight. London was impressed with Ripley's work and encouraged him to keep it up. Fun fact. The fight between Jim Jeffries and Jack Johnson that Dean just mentioned was known as the Great White Hope versus the Big Black Menace, and like all big fights was considered the battle of the century. Boxer Jack Johnson, who happened to be black, had recently been crowned heavyweight champion after beating white Canadian champion Tommy Burns in certain sectors of America, just could not let that stand. One after another, Johnson defeated all comers, until at last, there was only one logical choice that would finally step into the ring. It was the retired heavyweight champion, Jim Jeffries, who had himself retired six years previously. The fight was scheduled to be, believe it or not, a 45-round, three-minute-each event. For context, not the longest fight with gloves in history, that being 110 rounds in 1893, compared to the much shorter professional fights we see today, which is set at a maximum of 12 rounds. This took place in 110 degrees on July 4, 1910 in Reno, Nevada. It was held in the first ever arena built specifically for a Pacific event, costing the promoter 120000 in gold. The two fighters and the promoter, Tex Ritter, haggled over who would referee the fight. Eventually, invitations were sent, but were declined to both President Taft and to bare-knuckle boxing fan Sir Arthur Cohen Doyle, leaving Ritter to be the referee. After only 15 rounds, Jack Johnson had proven his skills in the ring, draining the strength of Jeffries and stunning the 16,000 fans in the area when he won the bout with a TKO, pinning Jeffries his first ever professional loss. It was, I'm sure, especially disheartening to those who had paid the scalp price of $120 a ticket equivalent to $3,272.85 today for a ringside seat. Johnson earned the highest payout of a fighter to that day of $60,000, or $1.6 million today, while Jeffries earned $45,000 and a $75,000 signing bonus for the fight, or $3.2 million today. If you want to see some footage of the events leading up to the fight, or the fight itself, you can find the videos on YouTube. I will put the link we watched in the show notes. While in Reno, Ripley also met journalist and successful author Peter B. Keen, who put the idea to Ripley that San Francisco was just too small for him, and that he should take his talents to New York. When another person he met, New York World columnist Ned Brown, put forth the same notion and then offered him a letter of introduction if he decided to come to New York, Ripley could not think of doing anything else. Once back in San Francisco, Ripley, feeling emboldened by the words and the encouragement of his peers, decided to ask for a raise to $25 a week, which was denied. This happened several times, until one day, Ripley said that if he didn't get his raise, 
he would quit. Well, trippers, you can already guess where this is going, right? Yep, he was told he was free to leave immediately. So, after wandering around the city and through Chinatown to calm down, Ripley made his way to the San Francisco Press Club, where he met up with Keen, who again suggested he head to New York. Ripley insisted he couldn't because he was broke, but Keen had offered him a solution. The solution came in the form of a job, illustrating the autobiography of the aging actor Joe Taylor. Taylor took a liking to Ripley and told him tales of his childhood and the minstrel show, acting with the troupe in Shanghai, surviving killer storms, and knife-wielding pirates, just to name a few. Ripley earned a hundred dollars and a book credit for his work, but those tales totally engrossed Ripley and made him realize that the world was a much bigger place than he ever thought, making him want to see these things for himself even more, and solidified his decision to move to New York. When Ripley got to New York in 1912, he found that the letter of introduction he was promised for a job at the New York World wasn't going to be available to him, due to the recent death of the owner, Joseph Pulitzer. Yes, that Pulitzer. So Ripley headed over to the Globe and Commercial Advertiser, founded by Alexander Hamilton in 1798, and first edited by the now infamous Noel Webster. Once again, his work managed to get him a trial run at the paper with the $25 a week he wanted for his work in San Francisco. This job was a boon for Ripley's career, as the Globe was part of the Associated Newspaper Syndicate, which allowed for smaller papers to purchase the right to carry the work of larger papers as part of their own local production, which meant that Ripley's cartoons were soon being seen not only in New York, but also as far away as San Francisco, where it appeared in the paper of his most recent employer anyway. In 1913, the Globe gave Ripley his first taste of international travel when they sent him to Europe on an assignment to cover sports and provide cartoons and stories about his travels. This was a very expensive and risky proposition for the paper, as Ripley was just a rookie in their organization and had barely traveled anywhere in the United States much less outside of it. Ripley traveled first to Egypt, where he took in the local sites, including the pyramids and an interesting variation of a baseball game, where there are eight men to a team, eight outs per inning, and had only one strike available to the batter before he was out. Ripley, of course, had to stop and sketch it. The Egyptians had seen baseball in person, of course, from the Goodwill Tour placed near the Giza Pyramids between the Chicago White Sox and the All-Americans, a collection of National League players, in 1889. But as an interesting side fact, it might not have been the first time they'd seen something similar. The Egyptians are the first culture documented to use both a stick and a ball in a game, and it's thought that it goes back as far as 2400 B.C., That far back, of course, it was more of a ritual between Pharaoh and his priest as a welcoming of the renewal of spring and a fertile rite, and was known as Seeker Hermat, or Battling the Ball. We are putting a link to the show notes to a fascinating article about this practice, titled Pharaoh at Bat, so be sure to check it out. When he got to Europe, Ripley traveled to Rome to visit the Colosseum, the birthplace of professional boxing, then to Germany to witness the traditional sword fighting contest known as Menzor, and then even more boxing in France at the Cirque de Paris. But in the end, he ran out of funds, and when he got back to New York, he had to play the role of porter to other passengers just to earn enough to take the ferry back to the city. Not wanting to stay that way, Ripley redoubled his efforts at his craft, and he expanded the things he covered, including automobile racing, tennis, golf, and even billiards. His salary quickly tickled up to $100 a week over the next four years, to the equivalent of $105,000 a year today. Throughout the middle of the 1910s, Ripley saw many of his friends achieving wealth and fame with their work as cartoonists. Some by their syndicated cartoons in the paper, others with their move into animated pictures. Ripley, however, collected articles about amazing athletic feats, 
like the longest field goal or the longest touchdown run, to weird people doing extreme sports like men who walked or ran long distances, like John Ennis, who crossed America on foot in 80 days, or about a man that skipped rope 11,810 times. Ripley had a nose for digging out these stories, then making drawings of the odd facts. He called his cartoon series Unusual Records, and it would be the forerunner of his eventual big idea. He would have to wait on acting on his idea, though, because in 1917, the United States entered the war in Europe. Ripley was required at the time to fill out a draft registration card under the recently passed Selective Service Act, but he purposely lied about his age and about providing direct support to a family member to gain an exception from service. He was supporting his younger brother Doug after their mother had died, but Doug was living with a friend of the family in California and not with Ripley. Ripley did, however, do what he could to turn his drawings into inspiration for the troops by always showing them in the best ways as fighters and the best of the best. In fact, some of his sketches were turned into recruitment posters for the war effort. He would collect his inspirations from traveling to military bases and onboard naval ships, often promoting Liberty Loans and Red Cross donations while he was there. Finally, with the war over, Ripley could start putting his ideas into action. In December 1918, Ripley put some of his collections to good use and drew up a sketch for some of them that he titled Champs and Chumps. While he liked the idea, he still felt that it wasn't his best work. It was more of a throwaway piece compared to the other work he had done. However, when readers started writing in, the paper encouraged him to keep it up, though he would not sketch for another 10 months, with the first one being named Believe It or Not in 1920. Some of the lapse in time between these publications can possibly be contributed to the fact that Ripley found himself a new love that came in the beautiful and talented form of teenage beauty queen, model, Ziegfeld Folly Girl, Beatrice B. Roberts. They had been introduced the night the Champs and Chumps cartoon had been published while Ripley was out for a night on the town. Being seen with a Follies girl got you recognition, and marrying one was seen as something like a badge of honor. William Randolph Hearst who will become more important to our tale in just a bit, had won as his very public mistress. Ripley was 10 years the senior to 18-year-old B, but he fell for her quickly, and she for him. So, they were married on October 23, 1919. It didn't take long, however, for the two to find out that they were very hastily in their decision to wed. For his part, Ripley wanted to continue his life as if he was still a bachelor, living on his own in his small apartment, going out every night, or taking lengthy assignments away from town. B, for her part, was insanely jealous and overly suspicious that Ripley was with other women, which he was likely doing. When they were together, they often fought about his work and unwillingness to settle down and dote on the wife he had right in front of him, instead of flirting with waitresses or spending time in bars. They once got into a marathon shouting match at the Hotel Marie Antoinette. Another night, beckoned by an anonymous caller, Beatrice found her husband dancing with another woman at the Broadway cafe. When she confronted him, he dragged her to the street and put her into a cab. Despite it all, B continued to be in love with him, but had had enough by the end of December 1921 when she filed papers requesting a formal separation, charging her husband with cruel treatment, excessive indulgence in intoxicants, and fondness for other young women. A judge granted the separation and awarded Beatrice a monthly alimony of $125 plus $750 in legal fees. Her attorney told the press he made several attempts to Mr. Ripley to do the right thing by his wife, but Ripley's failure to do so had forced Beatrice to bring her complaints to the judge. Ripley, for some reason, probably because he couldn't deny the charges, declined to publicly defend himself. Finally, the marriage went down in flames one night after Beatrice followed him to the Great Northern Hotel and up to room 304. He and another woman had shared a quiet dinner and a few drinks. Then, 
returned to his room for a nightcap. One thing led to another. Clothes were removed. The romantic mood was suddenly interrupted by an urgent knocking at the door, and then shouting, then pounding. Somehow, his spouse had found him. Ripley emerged, flustered, and wearing only a bathrobe, to find Beatrice, accompanied by two other men, an elevator operator and a shoe salesman he later learned in court. B saw the other woman and became even further irate. Beatrice announced that she was finally through with him, and now it would be up to a judge to decide the details. Their divorce was finalized in 1923, with B receiving a judgment of $200 a month plus her legal fees. Throughout the time he was married to B, he was still traveling and working for the Globe, and you can see her argument for the abandonment plainly enough. He took his first solo trip to Europe in 1920 to cover the Olympics, which would have taken him weeks if not longer since he traveled by ship, and then took a four-month around-the-world tour for the paper, without her, of course, who called his reporting Ripley's Rambling Round the World. He turned in his dispatches from his trip along with sketches every few days, and the Globe then sold them to the Associated Newspaper Syndicate, meaning they were being read all over the country. During his trip, Ripley brought to his readers a myriad number of unusual things, like the Okalehau of Hawaii, which we covered in episode 11, surfing, the Japanese religion of Shintoism, tea ceremonies, rickshaws, sacred cows, and holy men sleeping on beds of nails, as well as the more unpleasant things he saw, like the large number of battleships in the Japanese harbor, the mobs of poor beggars, lepers, the in-your-face poverty he discovered in China, the dead being burned or fed to vultures in India, and little girls married off as early as the age of three by the Arabs of the Middle East. Despite it all, Ripley wanted to see what was out there, and often made his way off the beaten path to find the things he had only ever heard of, including while in Hong Kong, taking a side trip in the attempt to track down some headhunters, which we covered in episode 10, but was disappointed to find they had all been rounded up and put into concentration camps of sorts. Ripley didn't want to travel for the sole purpose of mailing picture postcards back to envious home folks, so he continued to explore outside the safe bubble of the tour company's itinerary everywhere they went. After this around-the-world journey, Ripley came to realize that just sports feats only would not work for his believe-it-or-not cartoons. In fact, he grew even less interested in the strange things people did in the name of sport, and more fascinated by the implicable things people did in the name of religion as well as accounts of the gruesome. He was all set to bring these cartoons to life and was on the hunt for a suitable translator to help him with the work when the Globe was sold to Frank Munsey. Munsey currently owned two other New York papers, but over time had owned 16 papers which he had either closed or had consolidated, so the sale was potentially bad news for Ripley, who feared that Munsey would soon close the Globe. Munsey, who also held grudges, was notoriously cheap, and who wanted to beat his rival, William Randolph Hearst, any way he could, did just exactly that by closing down the globe and merging the departments with one of his other papers, the New York Sun, in 1923. Ripley was moved to the Evening Telegram, luckily for him, and went to work again trying to develop his Believe It or Not cartoons. He still needed a translator to get it off the ground, but as luck would have it, in the end, what he got was way better. He met and then hired Norbert Perroth, a polyglot fluent in 14 languages, the near photographic memory, an avid reader and researcher who consumed an average of 7,000 books a year, a kindred soul who would go on to work for Ripley tirelessly for the next 26 years. Unfortunately for Ripley, Munsey wasn't done, and the evening telegram was soon merged with the evening mail, and Ripley was out of work at a New York paper for the first time since moving there ten years before. He was picked up by the Associated Newspaper Syndicate to produce work for them on their art staff, but it was infrequent and did not show in New York papers at all. He had grown so famous by this point that he couldn't get work with the other papers because so many cartoonists were imitating his style and underbidding his salary demands. In 1926, Ripley traveled to England to cover the horse race known as the Derby, 
Wimbledon, and the British Open, and while there decided to try new technology that would allow him to wirelessly send his derby cartoon from London to New York. Basically, it was the forerunner of a fax machine, but making him the first person, believe it or not, to ever transmit a cartoon across the Atlantic. This impressed the editors of the New York Evening Post so much that they brought Ripley to the attention of the extremely wealthy owner of the paper, Cyrus Curtis, who immediately wanted Ripley's Believe It or Not segments for his paper. So much so that he agreed to Ripley's salary request of $200 per week, or the equivalent of almost $3,000 a week today. Ripley agreed to the employment and signed on, making this the third paper he had worked for in three years, but would give him the opportunity to bring his creation fully to life and finally move into the level of fame that other of his colleagues had already found. Well, that's all the time we have for in this episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. But if you liked it and want to hear more, please subscribe to the show feed and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast directory. The more positive reviews we receive, the more trippers will be able to find us, and the faster we will grow, thus being able to bring you new content. Be sure to visit our website, theroadtrippingpodcast.com, that's tripping with a G, to keep updated on future shows, leave show suggestions, and find all the ways that you can interact with us all in one place. If you're able and feeling generous, then a link to our Patreon page can be found under the support link on the homepage. We've been your hosts, Dean Ward and Molly Malloy, and the Road Tripping Podcast is recorded and produced at Before Midnight Studio. As always, until next we meet, stay safe, trippers. <laughs>